It was Quirrell. You, gasped Harry. Quirrell smiled. His face wasn't twitching at all. Me, he said calmly. I wondered whether I'd be meeting you here, Potter. But I thought, Snape, Severus? Quirrell laughed, and it wasn't his usual quivering treble either, but cold and sharp. Yes, Severus does seem the type, doesn't he? So useful to have him swooping around like an overgrown bat. Next to him, who would suspect p -p poor st stuttering p Professor Quirrell? What's up, potheads? Welcome to the Restricted section, in which a bunch of nerds with potty mouths reread the Harry Potter series for the umpteenth time and discuss how the story and its themes have stayed with a generation into adulthood. Thank you for listening. If you haven't done the reading, don't worry, we did it for you. Here's what we are talking about today. Chapter 17, The Man with Two Faces, the final chapter in Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Harry reaches the end of the dungeon and finally meets the man who has been trying to steal the Sorcerer's Stone. It is not Snape, but Quirrell. His stutter is gone, and he's on a mission, trying to figure out how to get the Sorcerer's Stone out of the mirror of Erised. Finally, he uses Harry for this purpose. When Harry looks into the mirror, the Sorcerer's Stone appears magically in his pocket. And did I mention a disembodied voice has been speaking to Quirrell this whole time? Yeah, well, the voice insists on speaking to Harry face to face. Horrifyingly, Quirrell unravels his turban to reveal, Yeah, you know who. Voldemort has been living on the back of Quirrell's head. Quirrell attacks Harry, trying to get the stone, but he's for some reason unable to touch Harry without great pain. Harry blacks out, and then he wakes up in the hospital wing several days later. Dumbledore is there to answer questions and solve some mysteries, but you better believe he's withholding information, too. Harry's reunited with Ron, Hermione, and Hagrid. Finally, the trio go to the end-of-year feast, in which Dumbledore ruins the dreams of an entire house and ensures Slytherins will continue to grow up evil by giving Gryffindor the house cup in the eleventh hour. Then, satisfied that he's been rewarded for breaking many rules, Harry goes home to his summer with the Dursleys. So I'm wearing the dress that says roll with it because when Dumbledore starts explaining something, you just got to roll with it. You just got to roll with it. Okay. Are you guys ready to get started? I yeah. am. Okay. <clears throat> well, let's Actually, get into give, it. Actually, give me one, sorry, give me one second. Sorry. God damn I'm so it. sorry. I'm so sorry. Hold on one second. So we're kicking Andrew off the podcast, right? Yeah, he's done. <laughs> Can't do this shit anymore. Out. Okay, let's get into it because we are about to start the final chapter of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Snaps. We're talking about the man with two faces. Who is that man? Wait and see. Let's do a little roll call. Cool. Oh, okay, fine. <laughs> now they don't have to listen to the rest <laughs> of the podcast. Great. <laughs> It's the You're first sentence. It. <laughs> As we go around the circle, I would like you guys to tell me your true and honest feelings about exactly how Dumbledore handles the house cup in this chapter. My name is Christina. I'm your host, and I think this is an outrageous injustice to the Slytherin house. My, My name is Brooke. Brooke. Oh, oh, you go first. You go. My name is Brooke. And I am not necessarily upset. It makes sense. But the thing is, is he could have done this like days ago and not had it be just like a giant fuck you to a bunch of literal children. <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, I'm Haley. I fully agree with Brooke. I was thinking the exact same thing while I was rereading this chapter. He, Harry has been unconscious for three days. He could have awarded these points three days ago. He chose not to. 
And on the one hand, that's a huge dick move. But on the other hand, the vindictive 11 year old deep in my soul deeply, deeply appreciates it. (laughs) (laughs) That's relatable. Well, I'm Andrew. And I think the way that he did it, while not the kindest way in the world, showed an incredibly, incredibly adept sense of style. (laughs) (laughs) No thought whatsoever towards the feelings of the children. But man, what a reveal. He's got flair. Listen, he's an educator in the wizard world, and the first thing these kids have to learn about being wizards is that it's all about the drama. (laughs) They learned a valuable lesson that day about showmanship. It's so true. What's everyone drinking tonight? I myself am drinking um, Apothic Red, which is one of my favorite wines but i feel like every time i'm drinking wine on the podcast i say this is one of my favorite wines i just love wine my mom also loves apothic red like specifically that one it's delicious so good choice. it's delicious i'm back to my old uh my old cheap bitch standby winking owls in findel from aldi which as you said in the last episode or maybe the one before is a liquid cry before. for help are you okay it is I'm not, but is anybody right now? (laughs) Same joke as two episodes ago, too. I love it. (laughs) Circle of life. It's a callback. I'm very predictable. I am very predictable. I am drinking a hibiscus liqueur. That flavor is so good. Well, because I am a absolute beacon of style class and taste i have decided to go with a vintage 2020 bud light oh 2020 is a terrible year mm. well every year is a terrible year for bud light so <laughs> there like you go bud light. he balances it out by liking oysters as he was telling us earlier <laughs> yeah. now i'm imagining someone just guzzling bud light and oysters Ugh. it's andrew that's the dude who's guzzling bud light and oysters <laughs> Uh, no joke, whenever I eat oysters, I always go with gin and tonics. I don't know why, but that literally is like the drink that I will have when I'm eating oysters. All right, well, gentlemen, if you want your uh, your classy meal choice for your next date, there you go. <laughs> yes, because if there's anyone you should take dating advice from, it's me. <laughs> Ladies, Andrew is super lonely. If you're interested, send a resume to our DMs and... Tina, Haley, and I will vet it and see if we're sending you through. Okay, okay, okay. So the very first line of this chapter is, it was Quirrell. Do you guys remember reading this when you were a kid? No. I mean, I wasn't reading it. I was having it read to me. But like, do you remember the shock and awe? It blew my fucking mind. Yeah. I think I remember it, but I'm pretty sure that that is not a real memory. If You you know how like your brain will make you think that you like specifically remember something and then someone comes along is like oh no five of those key details are very different than the reality i think that's what it is for me where i really want to remember reading it but i don't wow interesting i was just so young and like guileless and and full of trust yeah that i I, just, I thought it was fucking snape he's a dick like why why would i think it was quirrell i was small and then it was what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, and I definitely remember reading this. It is certainly the first twist I've ever read in my life. You know, books, Island of Blue Dolphins or whatever, like they don't have twist endings the same way. This is a real mind fuck. And it's one with evidence where you can go back and reread it and be like, oh my God, like it was there all along. I'm just going to very briefly say that uh, Island of the Blue Dolphins did have a huge twist when her fucking brother dies. Oh my God. Sorry. <laughs> Don't remind me. I think the biggest twist for me was actually realizing that he didn't have a stutter. It's really, really hard to convincingly fake a stutter. And the fact that he did it for a whole year without messing up his speech patterns or forgetting to stutter is a legitimate feat. Yeah, it's like, okay, you can convince Harry, who's 11 and an idiot, but like also McGonagall, you know? Right. Yeah. 
like speech impediments follow like certain like there are different kinds and they all follow certain like patterns so like it's not just that he has a stutter like like amateur writers will sometimes try to write a stutter and like they'll just they're all over the place like they're fucking up vowels they're fucking up consonants he has a consistent believable stutter yeah I'm imagining him on his, like, solo adventures just sitting alone in a tent with Voldemort, and he's, like, again, and he's, like, I'm Professor Quirrell. Okay, (laughs) that wasn't believable enough. Go again. One of the things that I think some people might relate to is, specifically with Harry Potter, when I read Harry Potter, when it's a new book, something that I have not read before, I always have the same thing happen. And it doesn't happen much with other books, but specifically with this series, I would get to the point of like maybe three quarters of the way through the book and I would go into overdrive. And I think that's part of the reason that I don't remember specifically reading that line. And there's a bunch of like the big reveals that I don't remember specifically reading them because I would get into a point where I would be reading and reading and reading and I would be so engrossed with the story. It was to the point where I would sometimes just start like noticing that I was skipping lines. And then kind of afterwards I would reflect and think about what just happened, but I just had to get through the actual text. Yeah. I definitely, as a kid was really prone to that as well. I think that especially because I was a really skilled reader um, and it's a really good, it is a really good skill to have when you're reading, for example, Lord of the Rings, just skim on through this bullshit, get to the action. But in a book like this, especially this first book, which is so economical, it's bad news. And you find yourself rereading stuff and being like, I didn't even, I didn't even read the last chapter. So I trained myself when I was a kid, right around this age to read with an index card which helped me not to skip to the end. My eyes couldn't cheat. Like they, I'm really prone to my eyes skipping, right? When I'm, when I know I'm getting to a good part, um, I, I just, it's like a twitch, right? So I've learned to just, when I'm getting somewhere good, I just put my hand over like the whole next page. But when I was a kid, I totally made myself read with an index card so that I had to read line by line by line by lines to really get everything. Cheating was the right word too, because that's what it is. You're like, you get to a point where you're not satisfied with where you are. It's like, I want to, I just need to get there fast. I need the shortcut. Give me the shortcut. Which with Lord of the Rings is great, (laughs) but not this book. I definitely had that experience the first couple of times that I read the series on my own, but like the first times that I was exposed to every single one of these books, it was my mom reading it. So Mm -hmm. I did not have that option, which was infuriating i i love i love so much that she did that for me but like i'm the same way i kind of want to just like get to the good part and especially at like the last like quarter of every book it's like oh shit Sh- like shit's going down right and like with my mom i have to fucking wait and and i mean like it's good but also i would just be sitting there like please just tell me what happened <laughs> Did, did your mom ration out the chapters? Like, would she only do yes! a certain number of chapters a night? Oh, my God. Like, I mean, she Ooh. wasn't that strict about it, but it was like the limit was her voice. Cause yeah, it it's hard to read aloud. The same way. Like, she's the same way. She wants yeah. to get to the end. She was just really interested in where the story was going, but sometimes her voice would just straight up give out, and I would have to wait until the next fucking day. It was terrible. Yeah, I've been reading aloud to Sean a lot lately since we've been in quarantine. Um... And definitely the voice goes, especially when like I was reading this chapter and I was doing Dumbledore's speech in my old man voice. And like that hurts. <laughs> that fucking hurts. And I was like, okay, he just has a British accent now. This is still Dumbledore, British accent. Anyway, let's move on. So um, it's, it's Quirrell. It's Quirrell. Yeah. We find out that he's faked a stutter. He tried to kill him at the Quidditch match, which we know. And not only were these students pissed but the teachers also thought that snape was like insistent on refereeing this quidditch game just to fuck gryffindor over because it's completely believable because snape's a dick but it it really just goes to show that snape was dealing with more than meets the eye for harry in order to protect him in this way like probably mcgonagall was like you're a fucking dick Yep. Nope. True. And then, uh, and then Quirrell says probably like the truest thing that any character in any of these books says at any point, which is you're too nosy to live Potter. 
Oh, yeah. I also wrote that down. That is Harry's. That is, that is his whole character. And then I just love that the thing that Quirrell says about himself right after that, I have a special gift with trolls. I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but that seems like the weirdest fucking brag you could ever, like, <laughs> of all the things in the world, trolls. That's Weird my flex, thing. but okay. Well, I mean, it is relevant to the fact that he is, was the defense against the dark arts teacher. And let the troll in and had the troll guard for the thing. But it is a weird flex. I'm also wondering, and I know we talked about this with Fluffy, but like, who was feeding the troll that was guarding his chamber? Like, was, who was, how, how, how do, how did the troll stay alive? Does Hogwarts have interns? That seems like an intern job. Seven years. Just seven I'm, I'm imagining yeah. they have just like a slat where you can open it up and like drop stuff down in it, but like maybe not. Also, there's light in all of these chambers and it's never expressly explained whether it's windows or torches. If it's torches, how do the torches stay lit? Are they magic torches? That's probably <laughs> the answer. Hermione, when they fall down comfortably onto the devil's snare from the third story. She says, we must be miles under the school. Reading about this troll being in there just sent me into like the longest spiral of imagining an adult troll just in like a small box with maybe some light, but also maybe not light. And then getting, I guess, fed through, I've decided a trap door style scenario and I just don't know how it lived. What if it wasn't even, what if Quirrell put it down there because he's like, oh, by the time I get there, it won't even be a problem because that troll going to be dead. Oh, poor troll. Well, the house elves prepare the students' food and send it magically to the dining hall. So it could be that they're magically feeding some random pets in places. This might be the ultimate writing an excuse for a plot hole but we do know that vanishing cabinets are a thing so in theory there is definitely a way to have like an entry point with an exit point that is in a different location so maybe they just like chuck a cooked ham into one side of a vanishing cabinet close the doors and let it fall out of the roof of the fucking cave mm, ham. or trap door room alternate theory the troll is eating the house elves no! Andrew, I just need to say that having a vanishing cabinet that skips the first four of, like, a whole bunch of enchantments to protect the Sorcerer's Stone might be the dumbest thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, too. It's a shortcut, like in video games. I don't know let's about be, that, but... <laughs> let's be honest. If Dumbledore really, really wanted to worry about keeping this stone safe, it wouldn't be past an elaborate series of traps under the school where every wizard in the greater Great Britain area goes to. It would be inserted in between a cinder block in like the east wall of the 34th floor of the Chicago Tower. It would be in just the most random, probably muggle-filled place that does not get accessed. If you put it in America, then you have to pay export taxes, and that's got to be a lot on a stone that creates gold. And also, that costs you a lot on the drama aspect, which, as we have established, is the main priority for all wizards everywhere. <laughs> so, for the drama aspect, they're probably feeding the troll Jurassic Park style with a chained goat. <laughs> and I watched that your movie. Fourth tie in. <gasps> Aberforth, yes. Yep, that is your Aberforth tie-in. It all makes perfect I'm sense. Glad you Never allow his goats to befall such a fate. <laughs> okay, I'm pouring wine. I'm Let's glad go. you brought Aberforth into this. Otherwise, it would have just been a really bad idea. Oh, Maybe, fuck you. I'm leaving that joke in. I'm leaving that joke in. So, anyhow, they're at the final test, oh, which is still a test, lit. which is the mirror of Vera said. Yeah. Is just sitting in a room. Yeah, and so Quirrell is really focused on it, and Harry pretty wisely is like, okay, if I can distract him long enough, um, then maybe he won't be able to figure it out. And he falls back on his number one distraction technique, which is asking a fuck ton of questions. 
from a hero standpoint, this is genius because Quirrell wasn't going to monologue. He wasn't going to do the thing that you're not supposed to do when you're <laughs> an aspiring supervillain. And Harry gets him to do it. Like, mm-hmm. that's, that's fucking talent right there. You can't teach that. Yeah, but you can also kind of tell that Quirrell has been, like, waiting to tell someone. Like, you can, I feel like you can tell that he's been being. Oh, no, he's stoked. It doesn't take a whole lot to get him there. But Yeah, like, he's been undergoing some pretty serious, like, emotional abuse at the hands of Voldemort for a long yeah. time. And yeah, he's he like, listen to everything I did. Yeah. He needs someone well, to appreciate him. God knows Voldemort isn't going to. This, uh, this monologue that he has also answers a fair number of questions that we had earlier on. One that really comes to mind first is it says exactly when Voldemort like took up literal headspace with Quirrell. Um, <laughs> oh my God. Headspace. <laughs> yeah. That is Gringotts. From the universe. Yeah. It says after Gringotts. So he definitely showed up to Hogwarts with an extra soul attached to his it also answers the question we had previously asked of the um, fact that Quirrell was for sure the one drinking the unicorn blood. Mm, yeah. Like, he yeah. mentions that he was the one drinking it. And we get a fun little teaser. This is the first time Harry hears that Snape and his dad had mad beef. He, like, he brings it up so casually. He's like, but Snape always seemed to hate me so much. Oh, he does, said Quirrell casually. Heavens, yes. He was at Hogwarts with your father, didn't you know? They loathed each other, but he never wanted you dead. Does this mean that Quirrell was at Hogwarts with them? Like, is that how he knows? Because it sounds like he knows. Quirrell could have been a total Neville to them. It doesn't necessarily mean that he was at Hogwarts with him, but I've always been of the belief that the Marauders would have been one of those rare groups of people that when they leave a school, people still talk about them. And I think that lends some credence to it because he doesn't say he was there with them. And in my mind, I've always pictured him as younger than Harry's parents by a decent amount. He could have been like a first year when they like graduated and just like been peripherally aware of that alternate possibility. He could know from the other teachers because like, Mm -hmm. you know, the other teachers notice that Snape has like a fucking problem with Harry and are not okay with it. Like you can't do anything, but you got to know they're not okay with it. At some point someone's been like, Hey, what the fuck is Snape's deal with this one kid? Yes, Haley, that is a great point, because definitely, if Quirrell had been like, what the fuck is up with Snape, McGonagall would have been like, oh my god, let me tell you this thing. See, I think it's genuinely Snape in the freaking teacher's lounge, just being like, oh my god, he's so much like his dad. Like, did you even know his dad? His dad was a fucking asshole. Oh my god, um... Snape has kind of like a Kylo Ren situation in the staff room. (laughs) Oh, god. (laughs) Another thing that I think is really interesting here, and it's going to happen again, the wording that J.K. Rowling used when describing the relationship between Snape and Harry, because she specifically both here and when Dumbledore talks to him about it later, references Snape and his dad and the, the animosity. Yeah. Neither of those examples does anyone reference Lily. And what's really interesting about that is while everything that James did definitely antagonized Snape, I think from later on what we learned, the real thing that motivated Snape to have such strong feelings towards Harry is all based on Lily. It's not based on James. James was a dick in his mind and he didn't like James, but it's all feelings that are so strong because of Lily. If his mother wasn't Lily, Snape wouldn't give a shit about the son of James Potter. That is a really good point. I thought about that too. But you also have to remember that probably not that many people knew about Snape's feelings for Lily because he's not sharing that openly. It's a really integral part to his and Dumbledore's relationship. So Dumbledore has that knowledge. But Snape's not probably going around being like, I love Lily Potter and she's married to James Potter. Isn't that crazy? I have a motive. And also, from Dumbledore's perspective later in this chapter, you know, can you imagine talking to an 11-year-old? And the 11-year-old is like, why does this teacher hate me? And you're like, 
because he was in love with your mom, dude. Like, the 11 year old is just not going to get that, you know? The 11 year old is going to be like, ew, how dare you? She's dead. What up? Like, this is so complicated. I have so many feelings. So, during this entire, like, trial phase of like them getting through all these different levels and everything and arriving at the end they've been performing at a level that is like deeply above 11 year olds right like they're doing very very well and then we get to this final moment and harry's by himself and he's literally he's like okay i've done the questioning quirrell's still really focused on this mirror and he's like okay i figured it out like if i look in the mirror and i think about wanting the stone then i can see where it's hidden like i know i can do this and then he tries to look in the mirror and just falls over because there are ropes around his ankles and he ends up just like eating shit. And that is the more true to an 11 year old's abilities moment in terms of a heroic uh, attempt. Exactly. And it's those kinds of beautiful details that we don't get in the films. <laughs> Another thing that really kind of struck me about this uh, passage is up to this point, Quirrell has been a completely different character. Very confident, very, you know, bra about everything. You get this vision of a guy who's like impassioned and is like, I get to reveal my true intentions. But what's really interesting to me is if you think about it, Dumbledore hired this guy some number of years before. Because it says that it sounds like from the reading that he was a teacher at Hogwarts went to the forest, came back, and was different. But it never says just to the degree that that was. And I think that what's going on here is this is Quirrell trying to put on this false, like, I know that I'm, you know, I've got Voldemort on my side and I'm fighting for power and everything. But he, as soon as Harry brings up anything about the failures that he's had, Quirrell falls apart. And I think that it shows that this is a perfect example of someone who, is not that person who is a big, bad, tough guy in any way. He's not that at all. And when he found this, it's something that he's holding to, like, I'm powerful now. But as soon as he's forced to think about the actuality, he realizes that's not what it is. He, he's still that same cowardly person. Haley, did you have something to say? I was just going to say that uh, he was originally the Muggle Studies professor. That, that's in, like, some of the expanded material. Yeah, later in the books, they explore the notion that Tom Riddle may have cursed the position when he was denied from the Defense Against the Dark Arts position in the 50s, maybe. So I was wondering how Quirrell could have been here for so long, because definitely he's been here long enough to teach, go away for the summer, and come back and teach. Whereas, like, you know, in the subsequent books, it's a different Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher every year. But Haley, that really explains it. You know, he could have been the Muggle Studies teacher last year. Or maybe it's a cursed position, and last year's curse was that you get Voldemort in your skull, and this year's curse is that you die. Yikes. <laughs> so Harry is like, if I look in the mirror, I'll get the stone, because that's what he's trying to do. And then also Voldemort is like, if Harry looks in the mirror, he'll get the stone. Use the boy. Oh, so creepy. So Quirrell does indeed use the boy. And it works. But- Sounds weirder when you say it like that, but it does work. So Harry sees himself reaching into his pocket, getting the Sorcerer's Stone, putting it back in. Upon return to his pocket in the mirror, he feels it land in his pocket in real life. Well, I would shit myself, dude. I would be like, oh my god. (laughs) I, I would shit myself from the moment my reflection started doing stuff that I was not doing. You would not survive long in the wizarding world if that's all it took to unsettle you? I am fully aware of that fact, and that's why I'm okay with not being a wizard. So you would have shat yourself on Christmas, because yeah. that's, when, that's when he finds the mirror of Arison. No, because he's still doing, he's still himself. He's just seeing other people behind him. He's okay. not doing anything that he isn't doing in the mirror of Arison up to this point. This okay. is the first time that his reflection does other shit. Okay. Remember, though, Haley, that Ron told him that what Ron saw was his winning like the house cup and being head boy and all that stuff. So he knows about that. But I agree with you that I would be shitting myself at that time. (laughs) Not because of the mirror though. I would be shitting myself because that's the moment that it becomes real. That's the moment that you have the thing that this guy is looking for. That's the moment that it's like, Oh shit. I'm actually an 11 year old kid who doesn't really know shit about anything. 
And he cool. doesn't even know that uh, Voldemort can fucking read minds at this point, which makes this, like, knowing that makes this scene so much creepier. Um, well, he doesn't know at that point that Voldemort's in the back of his head. He <laughs> so gets true. The, he gets the stone, and then he's, like, heard this disembodied voice, and he's like, okay, very creepy. But he's <laughs> he's not, like, he's not fully understanding what's going on until all of a sudden he gets this whole, like, let me speak to him. Master, you're not strong enough. I have strength enough for this. And then Quirrell turns around, takes takes his freaking, well, he takes his turban off and then turns around slowly on the spot, which like really imagine that. And there is a fucking face in the back of his head. Were there any shit left in your bowels at that juncture (laughs) post stone acquiring? The rest has been released. (laughs) Um, I have in my notes, Coral reveals his dirty little secret, and as I was typing that, I was like, it probably smells terrible in there. Oh, I, I need to draw attention to this. There's a smell. There is a yep. smell around Coral's turban. It was brought up once before in an earlier chapter. Because of the garlic, right? No, it's like they theorized that it might be garlic because yeah. he was vampires away or something, but no, it's fucking Voldemort. Voldemort stinks, apparently. One thing I noticed throughout this chapter is it it says in several different places, I would say like five or six, that Harry is unable to move, which I think is very interesting. It's almost like a dream. Um, In this moment, it says Harry felt as if Devil's Snare was rooting him to the spot. And especially later when the altercation gets physical. Hmm. Are altercations ever not physical? Did I use that word right? I don't know. But it talks about Harry being unable to move. And I I think that's really interesting because, I don't know, I feel like that's a dream thing. I feel like in real life, it's like the opposite. It's like everything's happening at once. So that's all. I will say, if this is a dream, the level of sleep paralysis nightmare involved in the fact that someone's face attached to someone's head has just been revealed to you. And then... And this is, I'm just going to read this direct quote. Quirrell was walking backwards at him so Voldemort could still see him. The evil face was now smiling. Might be the most horror movie level shit I have ever read. It's terrible. It's truly terrifying. That is genuinely worse than any of the things that happened in the book The Exorcist. (laughs) In reference to the feeling like you're rooted in place, that is actually an incredibly common reaction that people have to dramatic si- or traumatic situations. Everyone hears about fight, uh, fight or flight, but the reality is that a lot of people fall into a middle category of freeze. It's the same thing with like a deer in the headlights. When a deer jumps out and sees a car and just freezes, that is a very common reaction, and it's one that a lot of people don't realize they can have. Well, and especially in this moment in particular when back of the head Voldemort has just revealed himself to you and you've been taking super mundane classes with him all year long, like, that's that's the kind of shock where your whole body shuts down. And you know what? You shit yourself. Yeah. And, like, from a literary standpoint, standpoint I think Brooke really has a point that, like, this feels dreamlike in the sense that this feels like a fucking nightmare. (laughs) This is horrifying. So like this whole chapter is very like dialogue heavy. Like there's a lot of just like blocks of dialogue with not a whole lot of like body language or, or facial expression, except where it's absolutely necessary. And like this kind of reflects it. Like your mind is kind of filling in the spaces of just like frozen there, listening to all of this horrifying shit. So one thing I noticed in this scene in particular, um, in the last chapter when Harry is having his I figured it out epiphany rant, right? When he's like, oh, Hagrid fucked up and Snape's going after the stone. He's going down, blah, blah, blah. Part of his rant is, I'll never go to the dark side. I'll never be evil. And I think that's funny because like, who invited you? (laughs) He's just like, I'll never, you know, like Luke Skywalker the whole time knows that the dark side is out there waiting for him. But like, Harry's just like, I'll never join Voldemort. And it's like, what makes you think Voldemort wants you? You or his greatest downfall and you're 11. In this moment, Voldemort says, join me and we'll, it'll be better, whatever, blah, 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 join me. And at first glance, you're like, why does Voldemort want him to join him? Obviously he doesn't. He just wants the stone and he can see 
I think, the conflict in Harry's brain of being like, I'll never go to the dark side. So Voldemort's like, hmm, he's thinking about coming to the dark side. Maybe that's how I'll get the stone out of his pocket. Another thing that Voldemort says that I kind of couldn't help but latch on to, and I don't know, maybe this is not the way it comes out. Maybe it's just rolling, not knowing where exactly she was going to go with the story. But he says, uh, but there have always been those willing to let me into their hearts and minds. And he's saying that in reference to post getting, you know, decorporalized by or decor decorporalized. I, I like having I like his body word. taken away by <laughs> Harry as an infant. So it does seem to imply that there were other people besides Quirrell that found him and helped him. And I just found that really interesting because we don't have any other reference to anyone else having interaction with him until Quirrell. Right. Yeah, there's just a lot of stuff of nightmares here. Quirrell comes at him and is like, I'm going to get that fucking stone. And then he gets blisters. Yeah, he gets blisters. Like, this particular facet of magic is one that I have a little bit of trouble with. Especially when I was eight, I was like, cool, 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 cool. Love is what did that. But I'm like 30 now and like I've read a fuck ton of fantasy and like, I don't know. That's not compelling. But let's get there at the end of the chapter, maybe. But the love that burns in Harry's soul also burns Quirrell's skin so conveniently. Oh, my God. So Quirrell's, like, grabbing him, and then he's like, ah, my hands, oh, all this shit. So then uh, there's a lot of, like, kill him, ah, tussle, run around. Have we seen any point in the book thus far where Quirrell and Harry came into contact? I would think not. That seems weird for, like, a teacher leaky especially cauldron. in like a, a mostly lecture class leaky cauldron they totally shook hands in leaky cauldron but, but, but that was but pre- Voldemort wasn't there yet pre Voldemort that that's a great detail because that was probably Quirrell's le- last day as a single gentleman if you catch my <laughs> I mean it is kind of like a it, it's it's a bare skin thing like Harry does specify that like Quirrell can't stand to touch his bare skin so like I mean, he's wearing wizard robes all the time. So this whole year that, like, if Quirrell touched him at any point, it was probably like, pat on the shoulder. Well done, Potter, on your fucking spelling test or whatever. Like, <laughs> Spelling <laughs> test. A- oh, no. Like, he's not going to burst into flames from just that. Right. Or even, to be perfectly yeah. honest, I feel like with the kind of contact that's happening here, you almost, like, could pat a bare shoulder, which hopefully Harry doesn't have a bare shoulder, but, like, and be like, oh, that was weird. Like, you shocked me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I think... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just thinking of this 11-year-old kid in, like, a tank top walking around Hogwarts. <laughs> showing off gun the shoulder. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's summertime now. <laughs> Sun guns out. <laughs> yeah. Rereading this has brought a kind of a new theory to my head, which is the idea that the reason that Harry doesn't have constant strong reactions to Quirrell slash Voldemort. Quirrell Demort? Quirrell Demort. Quirrell, it's their couple's name is because he only feels the effects after Quirrell has directly done something to strengthen Voldemort. Mm. So for example, at the Halloween feast or at the entry feast, excuse me, more than likely before all the students got there, he would have been like, okay, now is a perfect time to go get some of that there unicorn blood and strengthen myself up. <laughs> that Harry looks, sees, unicorn blood. you know, sees, yeah, sees them and feels the reaction. I think that what's happening here is before Quirrell would have gone down to take on the gauntlet, he definitely would have done whatever it is that he does to power up Voldemort. And especially now that Voldemort is as present as he is, that's why this reaction is happening. It is a manifestation of the love, but it's not as random as it seems. Basically, the only time that you get these strong reactions is when Voldemort is making an effort to be present in the environment. At least that's my that's my no prize excuse for J.K. Rowling. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless of the science of it, it fucking hurts him. And Quirrell starts going down, basically. As soon as Harry realizes that his touch is all he needs to take Quirrell out, he takes him out pretty quickly. Yeah. But the pain of being so intimate with Voldemort really wears on him, and, and he falls unconscious. And he hears a voice crying, Harry, Harry. And then he's like, I'm probably dying and going crazy. And then he blacks out. 
can the caption for this episode be in which Harry kills a man? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Does he? He kind of doesn't. He doesn't kill a man. I mean, well, he well dies. No, because Dumbledore comes in. Dumbledore mm. pulls him off. Already, like, pretty on his way to being dead, although, like... I, Okay, I really so how about this? So. I think it's a movie memory that Harry, like, kills Quirrell. Because in the movie, obviously, he, like, turns to ash and dissolves. But in the book, like, Dumbledore pretty directly says, like, Quirrell was, like, on top of you about to finish you off before I got there. I got there just in time to get him off of you. So maybe the description for this episode will be in which Harry kills a man? Question mark? I'm pouring more wine. Mortally wounds a man. I mean, they never, he never comes up again. He's never in, mentioned again. In which in Harry which, discovers the power of love. In which the power of love kills a man. <laughs> yes. You know what, though? As beautiful as that is, Brooke, I think I'm still going to uh, have my own personal headcanon that what happened is Dumbledore pulled Quirrell off, saw him blistering all over the place, and said, not my fucking golden child, and just curb-stomped Quirrell right on the stone floor. <laughs> just, bah! Dumbledore's oh. like a hundred. Um, and he's life, okay? Love. Yeah. Dumbledore lives. So just while you're talking about curb stomping, one thing I really like about... We're, okay, so I think our very next episode is going to be a movie comparison, but it, it's cool to point out occasional details while you're reading the book. And one thing I really like about the films in this particular chapter is the book doesn't really describe the place they're in at all, but in the films it's like pretty epic it's like this grand chamber that you descend into and there's like fire and stone and like it's kind of cool it's a cool place to have a fight and so i do like having that image in my head of the setting when i'm reading this which doesn't have kind of any this chapter has basically no spatial awareness you know what i mean Mm -hmm. Haley, why would Dumbledore make sure that the mirror of Erised is inside of a perfect chamber for an encounter like that to take place for the drama. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so Harry passes out, and as we learn later, Dumbledore swoops in just in the nick of time. Why, Haley? For the drama. <laughs> yes, he gets there just in the nick of time, and Harry falls unconscious, and then a section break, and then it, but then it goes into his like kind of fucked up dream of like a snitch, right? He's like really woozy. And then he wakes up fully. He realizes that it's not a snitch. It's Dumbledore's glasses. He's in the infirmary and he's not dead. Oh my God, crazy. Never saw that coming. There's only six more books. He only dies in one of them. Spoiler alerts. All spoilers all the time. So he wakes up in the hospital wing with Dumbledore, which like cool because I feel like we haven't gotten nearly enough information out of Dumbledore this whole fucking time. So it's about time for some fucking answers. This is a very important scene to me. This is one of my favorite scenes in all of the series. And the reason is, this is where Dumbledore wins my heart. This is where I fall in love with Dumbledore every time that I read this chapter. And the reason is, it's the first time that anyone just lets Harry ask questions and answers them. And that seems like a really silly thing. Hagrid kind of did it. But when you consider what Harry has been through, he's grown up in a house without love, without any sort of uh, authority. Well, not without authority figure, but without any sort of like parental figure. And he's gone through this hellacious experience and he finally wakes up and he gets to sit in front of someone who he deeply respects and just speak to them like a human. Let me ask my questions. Give me the answers that you can. It, it's where I get my vision of him being like the ultimate grandfather. Briefly, before we get to the whole question and answer phase of this podcast, um, which is the end of the chapter, I just think it's really nice that when he wakes up, he has a table piled with gifts from friends because the last Harry checked, the school all hated him, but they send him goodies. And my most favorite detail is, I believe your friends, Mr. Fred and George Weasley, were responsible for trying to send you a lavatory seat. No doubt they thought it would amuse you, which is a callback to one of the very first chapters when they're getting on platform nine and three quarters, and Fred and George don't know that Harry overheard that conversation. 
<laughs> they're just doing it for shits and gigs. I love they, it. I, they I love wish they toilet seats. Yeah, I wish they had allowed that to come through. Sam is at first. I know you have a spell for that, Madam Pumphrey. <laughs> Just to kind of build off of what Andrew said, like, not only did Harry grow up, like, without, like, a lot of affection, Harry grew up, if if you guys will recall, like, specifically under a moratorium on questions. Like, that was the first rule for a peaceful life with the Dursleys, no questions. Mm -hmm. And, like, Dumbledore is up front with him, like, hey, I can't answer all of your questions right now because you are literally 11, but I'm gonna do my best, so fire away. I think he does literally say fire away in this conversation. Yeah, that's true. In our first few episodes, I said a lot of strong words about Dumbledore. Do I love him? Yeah, you did. Do I love him? No. Is he an interesting character with a lot of fun quirks? Yes. And I do love the way that he, like, can kind of instantly, like, make... He just is, like, such a calming presence. Like, Harry wakes up, obviously, in the middle of a panic attack. Like, no time has passed for him. And he's like, oh, my God, the stone, all these questions. And Dumbledore's like, chill, 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 chill. Let's chat it out. And then also occasionally Harry be like crying during this conversation and Dumbledore just like looks off into the distance. (laughs) I I just, I like the vibe. We also skipped over one of the best lines of the entire book. What happened down in the dungeons between you and Professor Quirrell is a complete secret. So naturally the whole school knows. (laughs) And a lot of this conversation I found is pretty verbatim from the films, which is cool. And that is a direct line. And it was delivered so well. Like, it's, it's a great line delivered so well. I read it in his voice. And this is about where I gave up doing my Dumbledore voice for Sean. It was getting very tiring. Yeah, no, like, that. that is just a beautiful moment and absolutely the same. I just want to point out that uh, confirmation of Quirrell's death. Um, yes, sir, well, Voldemort's going to try other ways of coming back, isn't he? I mean, he hasn't gone, has he? No, Harry, he has not. He's still out there somewhere, perhaps looking for another body to share. Not being truly alive, he cannot be killed. He left Quirrell to die. He explains to Harry what happens after he passed out, which is that Dumbledore says that he got Hermione's owl and raced back, and then he arrived just in time to pull Quirrell off of you. Mm -hmm. Um, And then said, I feared I might be too late. And Harry gives him a little sass, a little sassy Harry. You nearly were. And he's like, (laughs) bitch, why'd you leave? (laughs) He's like, dude, okay, fucking chill. Uh, I was worried about you, kind of. And, like, I was, like, really afraid that you had died. And I had to destroy the stone so that this wouldn't happen again. So, uh, with that line, like, I feared I might be too late, you nearly were, like, Fucking Harry and his hero complex. Harry isn't talking about his own life here. He's, like, the next line is, I couldn't have kept him off the stone much longer. So, like, Harry was, Harry's goal was never really to survive here. It was to keep Voldemort from getting the stone. And, like, and Dumbledore is talking about Harry's life. And Harry is talking about the stone. Yeah. So then Dumbledore reveals the stone has been destroyed. And then Harry is like, but your friend, Nicholas Flamel, and one of my favorite parts of this chapter, Dumbledore, sounding quite delighted, says, you did do the thing properly, didn't you? Like, you did your homework. Okay, I can't even be mad. You're going to get points given instead of deducted for this. Um, (laughs) But basically, he's like, one of my oldest, bestest friends and comrades, he going to die because of you. Nicholas Flamel and his wife, Perinel, which is a beautiful name I've never heard before. Um, they go and die. We get a really, in my opinion, underrated, beautiful Dumbledore quote when we find out that Nicholas Fimmel's going to die because obviously Harry's real worried about it because he's 11 and Dumbledore being 100 and, uh, years old is like, <laughs> is like, yeah, I mean, death is, you know, it's a whole thing. But he says, as much money and life as you could want, the two things most human beings would choose above all. The trouble is humans do have a knack of choosing precisely those things that are worst for them. It is deeply underrated. I've never heard anyone that's not on any binders anywhere, and it should be. But spoken truly like someone who probably hasn't had any want for money in almost a century. (laughs) Andrew. And also, right before that, we get another line that to me is incredibly beautiful and sets up a lot of the themes going forward in the book. 
which is, after all, to the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. And that is something that will come back over and over again. Dumbledore's thoughts on his own mortality is, I just need to make sure that I get things set up. But I'm not, it's not a fear of death. It's not worrying about death. It's, I need to make sure that other people are set up so that when I die, it doesn't screw them up. And I think that's like one of the big themes that J.K. Rowling wants to impart on people is you can't be afraid of death because you don't know what it is, but it's another great adventure. It's another thing to explore. Or it's just blackness. Okay, well. Um, <laughs> it vividly reminds me of um, the Jeremy Sumter version of Peter Pan, which Brooke Haley and I have talked about as being part of our sexual awakening. Sexual awakening. Mm-hmm. Literally so sexy. Um, I'm 30 now, but when I was 15, that was a lot less weird to say. But Captain Hook's about a murder, Peter Pan, and Peter Pan is like, to die will be an awfully big adventure, or whatever he says. And it's like, yeah, yeah. And I also just love the word choice, well-organized mind. There's a lot of things he could have said, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of adjectives that could have gone there, but like well-organized. It just kind of, it almost implies that like in the subsequent books, Dumbledore has a bigger plot. I think it makes a whole lot of sense, though, even just in terms of like to the well-organized mind, you know, the thing that you hear from people that have had near-death experiences is like, oh, all of my life flashed before my eyes. And I thought of like regrets and mistakes and things that I wished I had said. And if you have a well-organized mind, I feel like you've dealt with your shit and you've got your things in order and you've said the things that you needed to say when you needed to say them. And therefore there's not a lot of regret leaving this world, you know? And also another beautiful thing about the word choice is because he says a well-organized mind, it takes the whole idea of intelligence out of it, which so often we think about dealing with death as something that either requires great faith or great intelligence to like look beyond into that realm. But what Dumbledore says here is it doesn't matter who you are, as long as you have your affairs in order and as long as you are calm and collective and approach it as what it truly is, it's not something to be afraid of. You don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be the most devout person in the world to not fear death. You just have to recognize it for what it is. And I really think that's a cool little piece. Yeah, it is. So so then we go into the question and answer portion of this chapter in which Harry asks a lot of questions of Dumbledore and Dumbledore may or may not answer. Sir, there are some other things I'd like to know, if you can tell me. Things I want to know the truth about. The truth, Dumbledore sighed. It is a beautiful and terrible thing and should therefore be treated with great caution. However, I shall answer your questions, unless I have a very good reason not to in which case I beg you'll forgive me. I shall not, of course, lie. So Harry starts with, Voldemort said he only killed my mother because she tried to stop him killing me. Why would he want to kill me in the first place? Ah, and definitely, definitely, I know for certain that when I was a kid, Dumbledore is the person who taught me what the word alas means. Yep. I absolutely had to look it up, and it means, ah, fuck. (laughs) Basically... (laughs) regrets so he's like the first question you ask me i cannot tell you which is i mean that's like the whole point of this series right but it would be a lot to drop on an 11 year old who just had a near-death experience like totally. yeah you're, there's this prophecy <laughs> yeah. he doesn't even know there's prophecies yet by the time we got to book five i kind of forgot like I kind oh, yeah. of I stopped questioning it. Like this, this was a completely satisfactory answer for me at the time. Like, oh, okay, we're just not gonna find out for a while, and then we get to book five, and it's like, oh shit, that's why. But which could you imagine how differently Harry would have hypothetically acted if he knew that there was this prophecy? Yeah, I, I think that's actually a very important point because one of the things that I will maintain until it is definitively proven to be wrong is that Dumbledore knew Harry had to be somewhat of a genuinely good person for any of this to work. Because at the end of the day, when everything is said and done, he's going to have to be willing to sacrifice himself. Whether or not he knows that he's going to survive, he has to be willing to take that chance. And what this shows is that Dumbledore doesn't want to put that weight on him. He wants him to actually have time to live and time to 
experience the thing that he has never experienced, which is getting to be himself and not live in constant fear. He was always afraid of the Dursleys. Every time he goes home, he's afraid of what's going to happen. He's afraid of he's going to get back to Hogwarts. Dumbledore wanted this kid to live without fear, and there is no way in hell he ever would have been able to unless he doesn't know the prophecy. Just as a reminder that Dumbledore is the reason Harry has lived in fear. It was his <laughs> call to take him to the Dursleys. Just saying. I, I get that, but at the same time, especially knowing what we know later, that he had to live under the roof of the relative for him to be completely safe. Uh, which I, I still I, take issue with that magic, but okay. <laughs> but either way, it just... it. Dumbledore, I think, does a lot of things with hesitation, but we don't see it. Whenever we see Dumbledore or hear him talk, it's always a very well thought out and very well reasoned plan. And I've always imagined in my own head that that's because Dumbledore literally thinks about every possible variable he can come up with. And that's how he gets these plans. That's why his good ideas tend to be correct is because he's thought about every aspect of it and this is the best way he can think of to make sure that harry is the person he needs to be to sacrifice himself and still give him at least something positive in his life whether or not you agree with love magic as a concept uh what we do get is so dumbledore explains love magic your mother died to save you if there is one thing voldemort cannot understand it is love He didn't realize that love as powerful as your mother's for you leaves its own mark. Not a scar, no visible sign. To have been loved so deeply, even though the person who loved us is gone, will give us some protection forever. It is in your very skin. Quirrell, full of hatred, greed, and ambition, sharing his soul with Voldemort, could not touch you for this reason. It was agony to touch a person marked by something so good. And then it says Dumbledore now became very interested in a bird outside of the window, which gave Harry time to dry his eyes on the sheet. Which made me realize that literally Harry just cried because this is the first time in his fucking life anyone has been like, well, your mother loved the ever living shit out of you. Like he, (laughs) he grew up not knowing anything about his parents and like, you know, no one ever really talked to him about it. And like, this is, really the first time he's hearing someone be like, well, your parents loved you a lot. And that is, that overwhelms him. and It's so sad. It might be the first time he's ever been able to actually talk about his parents. Yeah. So this may not only be the first time that he's hearing how much his parents loved him, but it might also be the first time he's actually able to talk about them. To someone who, who knew them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because Hagrid knew them, but kind of like from work, you know, but Dumbledore really knew them. And also Dumbledore sort of has the emotional nuances that Hagrid lacks. He's a little buffoony. I'm mad at him. This whole book made me mad at him. And then Harry asks, Did, do you know who sent the invisibility quote cloak to me? Which is a great act of trust because he does not know it was Dumbledore. And Dumbledore could be like, what the fuck? Like, give that to me. Like, fuck (laughs) that. You're 11. Confiscated. But, no, luckily it was Dumbledore. So maybe Harry, like, hadn't had a feeling that it was him. I feel like if you leave it on top of the astronomy tower and it shows up in your bed, like, less than a week later, there's not, it's not Filch, you know? That's (laughs) true. It's not Filch and it's not Peeves. Like, those are the only other people that have, like, a full-on map out and are frequently in random places all over the castle. That's true. So then then we get into the Snape versus James situation. Okay, so Dumbledore starts this conversation off saying that he won't lie. Do you feel like this is uh, not a lie? It's a lie by omission, but I think that, once again, bringing up, like Christina said, bringing up the fact that someone's pissed about not his mom not having the hots for them is not something you need to bring up with an 11-year-old. I think that if I was told an 11 year old, I'm not going to lie to you this fall. I think Dumbledore's in the clear for, for, okay. He does some fucked up shit later in this chapter, but I think right now he's in the clear because he, do, I, he doesn't lie. And I think that probably to Snape it, the whole, Oh my God, wait, Penny's coming for me. She hates when I'm loud. Ah, ah. 
Stop. I'm sorry. I'm not even laughing. Why? Why are you shaking like that? Can you hear her? No. no. Leave me alone. God, you're so scary. And now she's just rolling around like a fucking potato. Okay. <laughs> Would you say that a life debt is Snape's primary motivation in this context? Well, I think that, I think truly that that is what was like unforgivable to Snape. It's like, St- guys, if I die tonight, it was Penny, okay? Like, I want you to know. Good to know. <laughs> We've always you- operated under that assumption. If you think like how- dead under mysterious circumstances, it was definitely Penny. Can Cats not- frequently suffocate babies by going into their cribs and laying on them. Like, new babies, it's a real problem. You have to, like, make sure that the cat gets along with them because I- they'll lay on their face and kill them. Okay, so anyway, I think I think that Dumbledore is not truly lying in saying, like, he was heartbroken about Lily picking James over him, but what made it worse was that James didn't like him at all. And what really, really fucked it was that James saved his life. Because then you can't just hate him in peace, you know? So I, I think Dumbledore's in the clear. Well, and, and to further that point, the way that he words it is very specific. And what he basically implies is saying, without letting Harry know, this is, what, this is the reason that Snape did what he did to help you to repay that life debt so that he could go back to the good clean old fashioned hate. But what he's leaving out is the fact that the hate that he's leaving has more to do with Lily probably than it does with actually what James did to him. And also you have to remember the last question that Harry asked resulted in him weeping to learn that his mother loved him. Right. So, like, not a good time to say that the creepy potions teacher had the hots for her. I think Dumbledore's in the right here. That's all I'm saying. I don't frequently feel that way. (laughs) I think he's okay here. I think Dumbledore is omitting. I don't think he is lying by omission. I think he is simply omitting. I am also going to raise the point um, that finding out about Snape's whole deal with Lily is the huge plot twist of book seven. And once again, wizards are all about drama. (laughs) And spoiler alert, in book seven, it is not enough to redeem him. Andrew, don't speak. Let's move on. (laughs) Um, So then Harry's final question is, how did I get the stone out of the mirror? And then Dumbledore is like, well... Ah, now I'm glad you asked me that. It was one of my more brilliant ideas, and between you and me, that's saying something. You see, only one who wanted to find the stone, find it, but not use it, would be able to get it. Otherwise, they'd just see themselves making gold or drinking elixir of life. My brain surprises even me sometimes. Dumbledore's like, well, I'm actually smart as fuck. And, like, I had this great idea (laughs) that you could only get the stone out of the mirror if you wanted it, but didn't want to use it. Basically, I'm the best. And then he transitions seamlessly into the birdie bots every flavor beans bits that we love from the movies and the books. Okay, I have a timeline question. Okay. Um, He says, I was unfortunate enough in my youth to come across a vomit-flavored one. Has Dumbledore not had a Birdie Bot's Every Flavor Bean for, like, 90 years? And this is the first youth, in his youth. I'm like, is it youth, relatively speaking, like, in his 70s? Because, like, to a, to a dude in his, like, <laughs> 120s, his 70s would seem like his youth. Or maybe he vowed never to eat them again, but this is for the chosen one. Personally, I've never been a huge fan of gummy slash non-chocolate candy basically oh I'm so you're wrong fan. so you're, oh, wrong. So you're wrong. wrong yeah sure but either way hello you have you no. have you had yes. albanese gummy bears that, that's an important that's an important question and andrew answer the question have you had albanese gummy bears i have no i have not had those gummy bears well luckily your that's why you're wrong in, his birthday's in like four days guys <laughs> it is happy early either, birthday thank you either way though <laughs> If Dumbledore was already not naturally a fan of gummy, having a vomit-flavored Birdie Bots Every Flavored Bean would certainly put him off of Birdie Bots Every Flavored Beans. 
I think we should at some point do a bonus episode, but here's the thing is it's only good if we have video too of us playing that game being boozled. Oh boy. <laughs> it's fun. It's fun. So that's it, right? The Bernie Bots Every Flavor Beans bit is how we end that section. And then it goes into um, Ron and Hermione visiting and Harry bringing them up to date and then chit-chatting, chit-chatting. This is also where we first, like, really meet Madame Pomfrey. Yeah. Like and her attitude. And, like, what a character introduction because, like, this is the beginning of a long and beautiful not <laughs> but certainly relationship. Yeah. <laughs> She, she has not seen the last of this kid, and you can see that, like, as a professional, she knows it. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. I, I gotta say, Madame Pomfrey is low-key one of my favorite characters from this whole series. The way that she's willing to just, like, bullshit back and forth with students, I fucking love it. She is one of my favorite characters. One of my favorite, like, non-essential characters, I guess. She's, I mean, what do you mean non-essential? She's the only responsible <laughs> adult in Hogwarts. She grows back Harry's entire arm, okay? <laughs> she well, is essential. We, as we go on, it more and more frequently, we get these scenes of her just, like, muttering to herself, like, what the fuck is happening? Like, <laughs> that's always the impression that I got of her. She's the only sane person in that whole building who's just looking at the events year by <laughs> year, and they're getting crazier and crazier. And she's like, what the fuck is going Fucking Dementors. Are you tra- yeah, dragons. That's a great idea. <laughs> it just gets more and more unhinged with like, what the fuck? Do you think, well, and we can go into this in five years when we get to book seven, but do you think that Madame Pomfrey is like leading the hospital during the Battle of Hogwarts? Oh, yeah. I don't know if they go into it. Yeah, I, she's a great character. She truly is. And also, it's just, like, you're right. Things are always happening around her, and she's always, like, literally, what the fuck is going on? And it's, like, no, Ron and Hermione can't come in. And Harry's, like, I have to tell them that I solved the mystery. And she's, like, I don't care. Like, what the fuck? But also, she insists on quite a lot of recovery time, considering that all of her remedies are magical. So Ron and Hermione come in, and Harry's, like, blah, blah, blah. I did this. Uh, Harry told them everything. Harry thinks way too fucking much of of himself in this particular section because he goes into this whole paragraph where Hermione's like, I mean, you could have been killed. That's like super irresponsible. And Harry goes, no, it isn't. He's a funny man, Dumbledore. And this is the kind of arrogance that could only come from an 11 year old boy. Gryffindor. Um, 11 year old Gryffindor boy. I think he sort of wanted to give me a chance I think he knows more or less everything that goes on here, you know? I reckon he had a pretty good idea we were going to try, and instead of stopping us, he just taught us enough to help. I don't think it was an accident he let me find out how the mirror works. I think it's almost like he thought I had the right to face Voldemort if I could. No. No, dude. Brooke, Brooke, you delivered that whole thing in your mic impression. (laughs) Oh, yeah, that's true. That is your mic impression. Wow. Ah. Wow. Brooke, I think we need to talk about what you just said because I've never thought of this, but is it possible that a part, because we don't know for sure that Dumbledore knows about the Horcruxes yet. Is it possible that a part of Dumbledore thought maybe, I know the prophecy, maybe if Harry faces Voldemort now when he's super weak, he can kill him good. Like it's done. No. You don't have to go forward. No. No? No. I think this is literally Harry being, quote, too nosy to live, and then... (laughs) That is a quote. Dumbledore swooped in to deus ex machina his fucking ass out of a chamber. (laughs) And then (laughs) Harry turns around and is like, maybe it was all intentional because I'm kind of awesome and I deserve to get a one-on-one with Voldemort. (laughs) (laughs) Redemption. Honestly, Harry in his mind right now is like, that was my redemption with Voldemort. And it's like, no, dude, you have no idea what your redemption with Voldemort is going to look like. I, I got to say, though, as someone who was at one point an 11-year-old boy, you bet your ass that what he has going through his head 24-7 right now is I'm 2-0 and against the baddest bad wizard of all time. <laughs> Fuck you. I'm 2-0, yeah. bitch. Mm. Okay, so, so then Madame Pomfrey is like, fuck off. And so Ron and Hermione fuck off. And then 
And then who visits the next day? It's Hagrid, which like, bro, fuck off. This is all your fault. Okay, Hagrid has a sorority girl level meltdown yeah. about this whole thing. He's like, it's, here, I'm going to read this paragraph in a sorority girl voice and it's going to make sense. It's okay. all my ready fault. He sobbed his face in his hands. I told the evil get how to get past Fluffy. I told him. And I was the only thing he didn't know. And I told him. And you would have died all for a dragon egg. I will never drink again. I could have <laughs> chucked out and made your lips a muggle. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. He takes <laughs> it takes a <laughs> It was the I'll never drink again that really did it for me. <laughs> it's the I'll never drink again. And here's the thing, like Hagrid does kind of have a drinking problem. Like once again, drunk sad magic man. Like just drunk sad magic man. And then in the most sorority girl move ever, to make it up to Harry, he makes him a fucking scrapbook. <laughs> Brooke, I cannot sit here and let you bad mouth that scrapbook because I have had more feelings in my childhood in ways that I was not ready for as a young boy about the idea of that scrapbook than anything else. Something about the idea of being able to see for the first time besides a mirror over Christmas, see your parents and you together. That must have been just like... I can't imagine that feeling. I literally do not have the capability to empathize with that. I'm not saying it's not a very beautiful gift. I'm just saying it is like a classic girl, like girls that are friends. When you're coming out the end of a fight, you always buy them a gift. I don't know why. Sometimes it's like cake. Sometimes it's like a real thing that you know that they want. But like when you've had like a really brutal fight, are you like really fucked up? It's a thing where you're like, look at this sentimental thing I did for you because I love you and I know you on such a level. I I don't know if I've ever given a girlfriend a gift as a sorry, but I do get what you're saying. Like, look, I've been reflecting on our friendship or like whatever. It's not a formal gift. It's not a I'm sorry, here's earrings thing. It's a, hey, do you want to like go out for drinks? I'll pay. So Hagrid, yeah, he cries it out. And basically Harry, the 11 year old is like, it's okay. Like I survived. It's okay. We're going to be okay. And I think in subsequent years, next book, Hagrid doesn't do much better because he's, like, going to the forest. But I think after that, Hagrid's a pretty good friend to have. So, like, we're almost there, Harry. Because book two, Hagrid, like, went to jail. So, like, we feel like he's been punished enough. That's true. And, you know, like, his spirit is not good for cells. Mm, No. And I'm a little confused here because, honestly, I've always thought of Hagrid as what you get if you roll as high as possible with compassion, care, and love, and you roll just a little bit higher than zero on, like, practical skills and, like, thought process. Please define compassion and care in this instance. In this instance... He thinks of Harry as as a equal, as a human equal. And, and that's wrong because he's eleven. But he, he should treat- is the thing. Like he, he should well, like, be an adult. I guess. I, what about this whole scenario? Do you think is not okay? I mean, I get the blubbering is weird, but I've had people. Well, Andrew, Andrew, I'm literally yeah. cutting you off. You need to go back and listen to the last three <laughs> fucking episodes of the podcast because he brings in a legal dragon. He ruins the whole, like, he ruins the whole point of Fluffy. He tells a bunch of fucking 11-year-olds about very dangerous magic that they have no business knowing about. He makes the dragon their fucking problem. He then does not stick up for them at all and instead brings them into a dark forest where they almost get killed by Voldemort. And then at the end of all of this, he has the audacity to be like, please forgive me, 11-year-old, who should have none of this responsibility. The kicker is when Hagrid is running the detention that Harry and Hermione get for getting Hagrid out of trouble and Hagrid doesn't even be like, Hey, now that we're alone in the middle of a forest, thanks. <laughs> All right. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to write a defense of Hagrid essay for book one. 
and we can post it somewhere when I finish. Give me a few oh. weeks, and I'll write a defense of Hagrid essay. <laughs> You're gonna have down. to defend it like an actual fucking thesis, because I will rip every hole in whatever <laughs> oh, ass argument you are about to mount. See, Brooke, okay. you think that that's something I want to avoid? I, I, that's gonna be amazing. I love it, Andrew. I love it. Okay. Look, going toe to toe with me is a bad idea. Okay, okay, we we all know that. Really mean. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. <laughs> so this section ends with Hagrid giving Harry the scrapbook full of photos of his parents, which he's never seen before. And Hagrid says, "Do you like it?" And Harry can't respond, but Hagrid understood it anyway. Okay, that's a beautiful moment in isolation. So then, it cuts. It cuts to the okay. Well, the fucking end the, of end of your to feast. the feast. <laughs> I literally like okay. So Sean, my fiance, is a Slytherin, and I am constantly in my day to day life be like, "Well done, Slytherin. Well done, Slytherin." However, <laughs> and that might as well be the name of this chapter because Harry goes out of the feast by himself. When he walks in, there's a hush, and everybody started talking loudly at once because they know all the things that he did, and they're like, oh, he broke the rules, but it paid off, which is Grif- Gryffindor energy if I've ever fucking heard it before. Um, so th- and then it's time for Dumbledore's speech. Somebody else go. It's, it's Dumbledore's speech time. Wait, wait, you want someone to just read the whole fucking speech? Yes, well done, Slytherin. Well done, Slytherin. However, recent events must be taken into account. Ahem. I have a few last-minute points to dish out. Let me see. Yes. First, to Mr. Ronald Weasley, for the best-played game of chess Hogwarts has seen in many years, I award Gryffindor House 50 points. Second, to Miss Hermione Granger, for the use of cool logic in the face of fire, I award Gryffindor House 50 points. Third, to Mr. Harry Potter, for pure nerve and outstanding courage, I award Gryffindor House 60 points. There are all kinds of courage. It takes a great deal of bravery to stand up to our enemies, but just as much to stand up to our friends. I therefore award 10 points to Mr. Neville Longbottom. Which means we need a little change of decoration. It's just what? bullshit. It's just See, bullshit. Here, I, I'm going to defend this too, though. Oh my god, but, Andrew! You don't always you're, have to be the devil's advocate. Andrew, no, I, Andrew, Andrew. If you wrong. can't see why this blatant grandstanding and attention grabbing in the face of what should have been resolved days ago is problematic. If you can't see why it's problematic, excellent use of the I word grandstanding. I totally see why it's problematic, and I totally said in the very beginning <laughs> that I agree that it's problematic. <laughs> but it's already been stated that everyone in the school knows what happened. Everyone knows this kid went through hell. All three of these kids went through hell. I can defend every single one of those points given to Harry, Ron, and Hermione. The only one I cannot defend is Neville because there is no way that Dumbledore would know about that. But as far as what happened, Harry's been in the hospital the whole time. Should you not recognize something as momentous and something as grand as what he did with recognition in front of the people who are going to see the points? If Dumbledore had just given him the points, all of a sudden people would have woken up and Gryffindor would have had what, 160 extra points out of nowhere? This way he gets to recognize the biggest achievements in the school that year, something that probably should result in a more formal reward, like when Tom Riddle got rid of Aragog. But he needs, rec- something like this deserves recognition. And the fact is there hasn't been an opportunity to give it until this point. I simply feel that this is incredibly blatant favoritism because the math didn't have to go this way but it did and even if harry deserves 50 points for 60 points for confronting voldemort that's definitely a negative 20 for each time a high-ranking professor told him to fuck off and he didn't right professor mcgonagall told him to fuck off she's deputy headmistress minus 20 points and then snape told you to fuck off if Deputy Headmistress gets killed in the line of action, he's the Deputy Headmister. Minus 20 points. I think there's just, like, no accounting for how they broke so many rules to get in this. Like, yeah, a lot of kids 
a lot of seventh years probably could have gotten through that gauntlet and fucking gotten through it in the same way that Harry did. But Harry's the one who decided to break the fucking rules. And why the fuck should he be rewarded like that? And why the fuck does the math have to be so specifically to fuck the Slytherins? It is simply unfair. Even if, even if you want to say like, okay, fine. The points are fine. Here's the way to do it. He's having conversation with the hospital. He's like, hey, by the way, I already gave Ron and Hermione 50 points. I gave Neville 10 points. I'm going to give you 50 points. We really appreciate it. And then at the end of your feast, he can give a big ass speech about whatever the fuck he wants. He can give a big ass speech about like, hey, like, I know this was a last minute upset, but here are all the really important things I want to say about this moment. What he didn't have to do is this bullshit. What you're all missing here is the fundamental truth that wizards <laughs> are all about drama. <laughs> but, oh, I mean, can I you blame think. all the Slytherins for going bad if you're treating them in this way? That's all I have to say as a huff lip huff. Yes, but the, th- the theatrics of the moment are undeniable. And you know what? When I was 11 and I read this for the first time, I was fully behind it. I was like, Malfoy Mm -hmm. equals all Slytherins and fuck these guys. But as an adult, I'm like, these kids have been working so hard all year. There's some kids in Slytherin who are graduating and they thought this was their moment to shine and you you changed the decor (laughs) in the Great Hall. That's how much you're fucking them. Draw up. Can, can I just say that for people, for anyone who is the least bit critical of Dumbledore and the oh. way that he acts, Ugh. this is a perfect example of him doing what you would expect him to do. Because literally what he is doing is reinforcing the idea to Harry, Ron, Hermione, that sometimes you've got to do what you think is right above what the rules say. You've got to be willing to risk yourself to go against all good judgment and to do the brave thing. And I'm not saying that's a good idea to have, but it is reinforcing that particular instinct. I would just say that that again is blatant favoritism towards Gryffindors. If you're going to value the brave thing, why not value the smart thing, the friendly thing, or the resourceful thing? Like you are running a school. Rules are all you have. I hate it. This, this, that little section ends with, it was the best evening of Harry's life, better than winning at Quidditch or Christmas or knocking out mountain trolls. He would never, ever forget tonight. And that just doesn't hold up at all. <laughs> this is the last you hear of it. <laughs> and then the, the beginning of the next section starts with, but what Harry did almost forget was exams that he took. Because he's still a student <laughs> beholden to the rules, regardless of what Andrew thinks. Thank God he passed them all somehow, even though he had a crippling migraine the whole time and impending doom left and right. So then it says him and Ron passed. Hermione, of course, came top of year. Even Neville scraped through, which is like such a vivid verb there. And then suddenly the wardrobes were empty. Their trunks were packed, blah, blah, blah. And it's, it's time to go. And they get on the boats for some fucking reason. They're not even being hazed anymore. They just like get in the boats to go back. It's because, I think it's because J.K. Rowling had not invented Thestrals yet, and she's like, sure, boats. They just all get in boats. And then they get on the train, and then they go back, and then Jenny Weasley is like, there is, mom, there is. This is the smallest little world-building detail, and it doesn't matter, but we were talking earlier about how, like, sometimes your eyes kind of scan past stuff because you stop caring, and one of those details is the wizened old guard who stands by the ticket barrier letting people go out in like twos and threes so they don't attract muggle attention. I just love that detail because it's one of the things that like, like, you know, my ridiculous like memory for stupid bullshit in these books. Indeed. And one of those things that I remember noticing and like, and being like, I've never caught that before. And I just, I love these little moments so much. Well, it, a lot of the things in this book series are not explained. It's like, oh yeah, there's dragons in Great Britain and like we just handle it. And it's like, okay, I would love some more details. So I love when they explain things by being like, this is the way that we handle this specific thing. So then we get to the end and the Dursleys come to pick up Harry. And I think I'll probably read the last paragraph. 
Um, even though it's not very good, it's not nearly as good as it is in the movies. Harry hung back for a last word with Ron and Hermione. See you over the summer then. Hope you, uh, have a good holiday, said Hermione, looking uncertainly after Uncle Vernon, shocked that anyone could be so unpleasant. Oh, I will, said Harry, and they were surprised at the grin that was spreading over his face. They don't know we're not allowed to use magic at home. I'm going to have a lot of fun with Dudley this summer. And that's that. I mostly enjoy that we end where we began in terms of Harry learning about magic, and that's him realizing that this is a force to terrorize Dudley. That's what we call, um, wait, what is it? The cycle of abuse, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's it. We finished the book, guys. Snaps? Yeah. This clapping's kind of a lot for our microphones. Does anyone have any last thoughts or feelings? No. Wow. Too many for this. <laughs> Too many for this. This is the first time that I've read this this book with a critical eye, specifically trying to see things that are there and foreshadowing and anomalies and issues. It's the first time I've really gone at this particular book in the series with that intent. And it's amazing to me how even with that intent, I did pick up a lot of stuff I've never seen before. But those moments that have always hit me still hit me. It didn't matter how sterile and how matter of fact I tried to read the book. I still got pulled in and I still had those feelings of being a kid in elementary school reading it for the first time. And I think that really speaks to the magic of the writing because in the beginning, it doesn't even really necessarily feel like a Harry Potter book to me. But as it went on, it definitely hit its stride and then it sucked me in completely. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the magic of Harry Potter is that every time you read it, it sucks you in again in kind of a new way. It can kind of apply to, like, the context of your life in a lot of different ways, you know? So, like, right now, for example, we're all in self-isolation, and it's kind of like that cozy blanket that you want to snuggle up with. And at different times in my life, it's meant different things to me. I will say it's my first time ever rereading this book. Yeah, Um, that's awesome. (laughs) And so... That's been a really wild ride, just like actually rereading it and realizing how much I forgot and how much I didn't know and how much I had glazed over. Just, yeah. you know, it, it was it was wild knowing the end, going back to the beginning. I don't know, just general rereading stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't reread books. So thank you for forcing me to do this. You are so welcome. Haley, any last words? No, I think, uh, I mean, it's been a really lovely experience just, like, being able to look at something that's so, like, integral to, I think, all of our upbringings with, like, a trained critical eye and realizing that, you know, there are some things that, like, you know, any any piece of media that you consume, like, there are things that you can criticize, but that doesn't mean you can't keep loving it with, like, the same passion that you did, like, when you were first introduced, and... I mean, like you guys said, it it means something different to you every time you reread it. Like, I'm definitely reading this differently as someone in their late 20s than I did when I was, you know, having it read to me when I was eight. But it's the magic is still there, man. I mean, it's still there. In a way, isn't it? To me, what you said kind of opened up a new idea, which is that it's kind of a lot like going back and thinking about a parent. Because when you're young, when you're like 10, 12 years old, your parents have a certain, not necessarily like perfection to them, but they just have an aura about them. There's something about your parents that they are kind of immune to certain problems. And as you get older, you see the, a lot more of the faults in your parents. So that's kind of what it, may, it kind of reminds me of is that yeah. as you grow, you can see more of the issues with the writing and plot holes and things like that but you still respect it awesome guys i'm so glad i got to end this journey with you um just so our listeners know as a reminder we love reviews on apple podcast we read them all we'll maybe even read yours on the air we have a brand new facebook group it's called the restricted section detention crew because you have borne witness to the restricted section you now have a detention so come serve it with us there's memes there We're also on Instagram at Restricted Section Pod. We're also on Twitter at Restricted Pod. Please follow us. Um, 
you know, we're going to be doing some really cool bonus episodes over the next couple of weeks as we kind of get ready to get into Chamber of Secrets and you don't want to miss it. So definitely um, connect with us somehow because we love connecting with you guys about ye old Harry Potter. So let's get into some plugs real quick. Um, who wants to start? I've been reading, well, rereading the Cimmerillion lately. And I got to say, like, you know, I love, I love Lord of the Rings. But the last time I read the Cimmerillion, I was quite young. And reading it now with a better understanding of linguistics and literature and mythos, it's a much better story <laughs> with my literary background than it was the first time I read it. And I'm just enjoying the hell out of it. And then you can follow me on Instagram at Passion for Parts. And then you can follow me on Twitter at Grumpy Brook. I want to plug a podcast called The Women's War. It's done by Robert Evans, who is the same person that does Behind the Bastard, which I know, Christina, you listen to that. Yeah, um, awesome. As well as The Worst Year Ever, and It Could Happen Here. And Robert Evans is an incredible journalist and he's able to bring a lot of personality and real human traits to these characters that he talks about and it's a beautiful story and gritty and it, it i don't want to spoil anything but it's totally worth listening to after the last airbenders on netflix guys That's if you valid. Ever visited, or if you've never seen it before because it came out like 10 years ago yeah it's worth it it's good hell yeah That's yeah right. true I definitely need to get into rewatching it. I might have binged it in two days. Maybe, maybe not. You can follow me on Instagram at Ya Girl of the World. You can follow me on Twitter at Tina Fontina. A lot of the Tina puns were already taken, so we're doing a cheese pun. Sorry about it, Haley. Haley hates cheese. Hmm. And I'm going to plug myself. I'm hilarious. I'm a little bit smart. I'm very friendly. Also, all my co-hosts on this show we're all really cool people and most of us are doing the exact same thing as you are right now which is chilling at home so if you want any of us to be on your podcast let us know we'd love to i don't always have to scream the same way that i scream during this podcast i can be chill i can i can i can be cool so far i've been on two whole podcasts one about harry potter and one about lord of the rings but i swear to god I have other areas of expertise. So let us know. A lot of us are good at a lot of different things. And we'd love to chat with you. We'd love connecting with other podcasters. So hit us up at restrictivesectionpod at gmail.com. We'd love to be a part of your shit. And if you love Harry Potter a lot, hit us up because we're going to start incorporating guests into our next season. So we would love for you to be a part of our shit. Is that the end of it? I think so. Yeah, that's all you got. Sounds like um, it. Wash your fucking hands, stay the fuck at home, get the fuck off my computer screen. The Restricted Section was created and hosted by me, Christina Kahn, based on the book series by J.K. Rowling. All music by Ryan Kahn. Logo by Michael Hardison. Technical support from Sean Watson. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Restricted Section Pod or shoot us an email at Restricted section pod at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your thoughts, feelings, complaints, conspiracy theories, or lavish praise. I think I just dropped my earring into my glass of wine by accident because I have like a little shelf here. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs>